Our final class this afternoon from the BYU Family History Library is by Nancy Busby. And she'll be doing part three of her Beginning Ancestry series. Today's topic will be on searching and adding information and sources. We appreciate her great knowledge on this subject, and I'll now turn the time over to her. Okay, thank you. So I just a little housekeeping before I get started. I have put in the chat a link to my my um, family history website that I put together that has the um, the slide PDF of, of this presentation and the past ones and future ones. Anyway, if you're interested in having that, you can click on that link to get there. And if you're looking at the screen, which I guess you all are, that's great. <laughs> got the right one up this week. Um, I've got the address on there. It's just nancybusbyfamilyhistory.com and go to the Ancestry tab, and it's got the PDF for this part three Ancestry. So today I'm going to be going over searching and adding information and sources and just kind of navigating around in that and some of the resources that are available within, within um, Ancestry on those particular items. So this is part three of four beginner classes that, that I've put together, uh, searching and adding information and sources is this week. And we'll go ahead and start right off with the profile research tools. So when you, when you uh, go to the tree and you um, click on a person and, and enter their personal profile, it will take you to this person page. And I've got highlighted in red a, a toolbar that has a few items on it. If you don't see that toolbar on your, on your screen in Ancestry, sometimes it is turned off. So the way to toggle that toolbar bar on and off is to go over to the tools menu on the top right and select show research tools. And I personally like to have that on because I think there are just handy, handy ways to navigate around to have that, to have that going. But if it's taking up real estate on your screen and you want to have it turned off, you can toggle that off in that tools pull down menu. But I'm going to go over what each of those tools are. So first we'll go over view and tree. That's pretty self-explanatory. If you wanna get back to the tree where this person is on your um, family tree, you just click on viewing tree and it's going to take you to that person in the number one position on their tree and show the, the next three generations above them, assuming you have three generations above them. This particular guy on my tree, he, he doesn't. He just has a mom and a dad, that's all right now. So there's always work to do, right? Um, when you select the, the pers a person's name on the tree, it brings up this summary card, and you can get back to the profile from that summary card on the tree. Now we'll go over how to view notes. So notes is something that you can type in information um, about research you're doing or anything um, incidental about, about this person who, you're, who you have on your tree. And view notes will open up this, this window on the right-hand side. And just know that anything you type in notes is private. Um, but anyone who you've given permission to see your tree can also see these notes. So they're private for you and anyone who has permission to view your tree. Viewing comments is another item on that toolbar. Comments are something that you can um, add in any kind of text about the person, and those are those are public. Um, if you're viewing someone else's tree that is public and you um, add a comment to a person on their tree, that information is is also public. So anyone who like if your tree is public and not private, and someone makes a comment on a person on your tree, that comment will be public, publicly viewed by anyone who, who comes to see your tree. And last week we went over in detail quite a bit about the difference between a private and a public tree. So hopefully that's that's pretty pretty clear to everybody. But I think it's really helpful to understand the difference between notes and comments. And that, that's really the big one, is the viewability. There is also a little pencil 
like a little edit pencil above that toolbar. And that is your tree tag. So you can edit your tree tags associated with the person on your tree by clicking on that. When you click on that little pencil, it opens up this window to the right that also has tabs for notes and comments, but this is where you can see any, any tags you've associated with this person on your tree. The next item over is merging with duplicates. I've um, occasionally entered a person, a person's information twice, usually accidentally, and I want to just merge that duplicate within the tree. So that is how you would do that. So I'm gonna walk through an example of merging a duplicate with, with you all right now. So here on the tree, I've got Jesse Dempsey. He's, this is his profile page. And over on the right, you can see that under his, his parents, there is a, um, a line that says additional parent relationships. And usually that's not gonna show up because a person generally has one father and one mother. We all know there are other examples of reasons why you might have more than one parent. But if you see that and the person is not supposed to have multiple parents, you might wanna click on that and see what's going on. So when I click on that and open it up, I can see that there is another Barnett Dempsey, some clues that tell me there are two different people on the tree. Are I can see that the spelling of the name is a little bit different. I can see that the the dates, his his uh the death date of one is different than the death date of the other. So I probably want to take a look at those two individuals. Maybe they are two separate people. So I'd want to open up each of them and look at their individual profile pages and make sure I'm not merging someone that, that you know, because different people can have the same name. But in this case, I after I've kind of taken a look at those names and vetted out what I've got, I determined that I somehow ended up with two Barnett Dempsey's that really is the same individual. So, and they both got assigned to Jesse as the father. So I need to merge these in my tree. So I'm going to click on the second father, the one at the bottom under additional parent relationships, and I'm going to open up his page. And from here, I want to select merge with duplicate. And you can do that from that uh, toolbar that is pinned under his name or the pull down on the right. So I just select merge with duplicates. Okay, so now it's going to show that um, duplicate person on the left-hand side. So I can see that 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 person whose page I came from is in the number person number one position, and it shows a little bit of information about him. And on the right, it is asking me to select the duplicate person. So I want to find the person in this tree. So I am going to select. Uh, or click in that, that box and start typing Barnett Dempsey. And it's going to bring up some, some options for me. And I see the one that I want, and then I can just select that from there. And it, it's got them side by side now where I can see, see both individuals and the information about them on the tree. So now I have I have the option to compare the two. And I can toggle on or off the little, the little buttons by their names to select which information from which person I want to kind of uh, survive once, once the merge is made. So I, I want to select the information that I believe is the most correct as I do this merge. And I'm, and I'm doing this compare. Over on the, the person number two, if for any reason you've selected someone and their information comes up and you're like, oh no, that wasn't, that's not the right guy. I don't want to merge these two you have the option to select a different person here. And again, you can toggle on or off those little buttons by their name to pick the information that you feel is the most correct. And once you've kind of decided that, you can click compare. Now this gives this compare, when you click the compare button, it's going to give you a more detailed uh, view of these two people side by side. So you can see which individual has possibly spouses associated with them, children, siblings, um, just more, more information about them. And once I have determined that I do want to do it, I come back to this merge duplicate people and go ahead and click merge after you've compared them in more detail. So when I click merge, it takes me back to 
Barnett Dempsey, the one that, that everybody got merged on. I can see that his son, Jesse Eli, is still there with him and his wife. When I click on Jesse and go to his per profile page, now I can see that he just has his two parents, Barnett and Winifred, and there is no additional parent relationship listed. So I have successfully merged those two people and they're just one person now. Okay, another thing you can do with this toolbar is save a person to another tree. So let's say you've got two different trees that um, maybe you've created a second tree to just do research on a particular branch of the family, but you want to save this individual to someone on that tree. Um, click on save to tree. And I actually think this got brought up as a question last week that I wasn't able, I didn't, we, we kind of ran out of time last week. I didn't get to answer that question in too much depth. Anyway, you select the tree that you want to save this person to, and you can click on the pull down if you have multiple, more than more than two or three trees. Just click on that to select the trees that you want, and then click add new person once you've selected the tree that you have on your account. And it's going to bring up this add new person window. And it will show you who that person is that you're adding and just click save. And now that person has been added to the Doe family tree. You can, you can see that on the top left, which of your trees you're currently viewing. Um, so if you've got the same people in two different trees, if you ever have that circumstance come up, it's really important, I feel like, to always just kind of glance over which tree am I working in. Just make sure you're working in actively in the tree you want to be in. And you can just switch which tree you're in by clicking on the trees pull down menu or clicking on the, the name of the tree and selecting a different tree to go into. But anyway, from here, I can see that I've added Jesse to this tree, but he's just kind of floating out there by himself. He's not connected to anyone else in the tree. So now I want to connect him to a mother on this tree that I'm maybe exploring. We're pretty sure we know who his mom is, but maybe we're exploring some other, some other research options that have that have come up and that, that cast a little bit of doubt. So I've got the second tree that I'm kind of working on to see if I can pursue anything in that direction, make sure I've got the right the right people. So anyway, I want to connect him to someone in this existing tree now. So I'm going to say add mother and I can um, select someone who's in the tree or I can add it as a new person if that person doesn't exist. In this case, I'm going to click on select someone in my tree and I typed in Jane, it brings up Jane Doe, his supposed mother, and I want to connect him to her on this view. So I select her and click Save. Now I'm viewing Jesse in the Doe family tree, and it's got him connected to an ex you know one of the existing people in my tree now. Okay, you've also got a, a shortcut to printing from this toolbar. Click on print and it opens up basically a family group sheet of the person whose profile page you're on. So th this is just your basic print options window, right? Just click print, select your printer. Maybe you're going to print to a PDF or a local printer. Wherever you want it to go, choose black and white color, all the things, the paper size, and just go from there. You There are a few things you can do to customize the view. Maybe you want to see this, the person's siblings or not. Anyway, you can toggle those different things on and off under customize. And Ancestry has a program called My Canvas that allows you to print family history into different media types. So books or um, large format that you can frame, put on the wall, that kind of thing. So if you want to explore any of those printing options, I am not going to dive deep into that in this presentation, but just be aware that that is part of Ancestry and that's something you can take a look at doing. Those are all paid services through Ancestry, but can be really helpful if that is something you're interested in doing. When you click on my canvas, it's going to bring you to a page that walks you through all of the different options of alternatives they have for the ways you can print. Okay, so when you click on print, here's your, here's your, your options for your printer and your paper size the direction it's going on the page, all that. All right, the last item on that toolbar is Member Connect. 
when you click on member connect, it is going to open up a window for you that shows the, I guess we'll, we'll, what they call connections. So this is showing me that somebody else in Ancestry has a tree that has a Jesse Dempsey that they're suggesting is the same as the guy on my tree. So this allows for collaboration within Ancestry. And just, so these are individual trees, right? So each, each uh, member of Ancestry, you, me, and every other person out there, they have created their own tree and entered all the people on their tree. And there's going to be some duplicates across the way because you're maybe your cousin has an ancestry tree, or maybe your mom does, or your brother, and, and their their tree is going to look very similar to yours on some of those branches, right? So this is just showing me other people who are working on researching or have on their tree the same person. So it, it tells me that I have a couple of connections. So I could click on their tree if their tree is public, I can view their tree and compare the information they have on their tree to mine and see if I can find out anything new from them or see if I have something that I could possibly share with them that they don't have. Recent activity is going to um, show you what other, other people who have trees are like, as, as anyone in your current network of connections, have they been actively working on this person? So it's going to show if there's any been any recent changes with anyone. There are different filters you can toggle on and off. Those are very individualized. So you just have to, if this is something that is um, helpful to you in collaborating on looking at a, at a particular person in a family, you'll want to explore all of those different options and make sure you have all the settings the way that you would particularly like. The third one over is suggested connections. The one in the middle, the first one I looked at, those are connections I've already made. I've already said I want to connect with these people so that I can get back to their trees to view it. Okay, so the one on the far right, suggested con connections. This is where you're surveying to see who you want to connect with. Okay, so you can scroll. I could scroll through these 10 possible connections that have to do with research on this person and see if I feel like anyone else's tree is going to be helpful to me. And if I click on the connect, the connect button, it's going to bring up this little uh, preview of whose tree I'm looking at. So in this case, it's Sarah Lee's 336's tree. And um, it shows me in the little brief caption about the information on their tree compared to mine. So that kind of helps me determine is this person on their tree really the same individual? Like, do we have do we have a common ancestor together? And then you can decide if you want to connect or not. And if you do connect with them, it pops it in that middle where you already have made connections. Okay, now I want to go over the profile tabs. The life story. So underneath those tools, there are um, four menu items that you can choose from. And life story is there on the left. And it, it what I'm showing here on this screen is an auto-generated little blip, little caption about Jesse. Basically, the, um, the AI of Ancestry has taken all the information and data that I've entered and put it into sentences, right? If you don't like seeing that auto-generated life story and you want to just type your own, go to the trees pull down menu and go to create and manage trees and go to the tree settings for that specific tree. And under tree settings, you can toggle on or off this button that says automatically build stories for this tree. So you can check that box and turn off that check if you don't want it to do that. Or if it's not doing it and you want it to, this is how you get back to that to turn that on. So over on the right, it's you have some options about what you're going to show on this view. If you want to see family events or and or historical insights, these are things you can just check on or off, depending on how you want to view it on your tree. And you can add custom events on this on this life story timeline by just clicking on add event and it just kind of walks you through, fill in the box and it will add that as a custom event to this person's life. Also, you can take what has been auto-generated and edit that. So you can click edit, 
and start typing in more information or changing some of the sentences to kind of more be in your voice. And once you're done editing that, it just brings up this little edit window. Just make sure you click save to keep those changes. Okay, uh, the next item over is facts. This is generally what comes up when you first open a person's profile page from the summary card on the tree. So if you're, if you're new to Ancestry and this feels a little overwhelming, I'll just kind of break it down. There's three columns, facts on the left, sources in the middle, the family is on the right, just to get you oriented to what you're looking at. If you scroll down on that same page, if you have a lot of information like, like I do on this example, you have to scroll down. So in the middle column, the hints that you've attached to a person from Ancestry are going to be on the top of that sources list. So that middle column that says sources, you can see right under it there at the top, it says Ancestry sources. If you want to do uh, an, another search for more possible sources, you can click on search on Ancestry. And then in the right-hand column, if you scroll to the bottom of the family, you can add family members, parent, spouse, children at the bottom of the list of the family. Just click on add family. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom of this example, the middle column where the sources are, the, the bottom half of the sources are sources that I have added from an external, that are external links from Ancestry. So they may be from websites. They have got some on here that are from Family Search. Um, you might create custom sources that you don't have necessarily a web link to. Maybe you have a certificate that you're holding in your hand that you're going to scan and enter in, and you want to create a source for that certificate. You can do that here and add, add that document as a source. And so it would be underneath these custom sources here. So you can add a source that you just type it in or add a web link for a new source here at the bottom. And then the left-hand column that has all of the facts about a person's life, you can add custom facts here that might not show up in the typical, here's where they were born, here's where they died, here's who their parents are, here's who their siblings are. Um, maybe you want to put in that they served in the Korean War and you want to put the years, you know, the year range for that. So you can add a custom fact on their personal timeline from here as well. Okay, so on the profile tabs, you also can get to your gallery from here by just clicking on gallery. So the gallery, they've made a few little minor changes to over the last six, six months or so. It seems like they're always tweaking and adding things here and there. So anyway, basically this is what it's gonna look like. If you have lots of images and photos and stories and audio, audio, they'll all show up here. Over on the left-hand side, you can see I have it under all media. And on the far right, you can sort how you're viewing that media by just clicking on sort. And that pull down is going to give you the options of the different ways you can sort alphabetically or by date. And there's also a filter. So you click on that pull down menu and it's going to open some different filter options if you have a, a lot of, of media that you you want to get to a specific kind you'll want to use the filters um, as you're viewing those things and then you can add media from here by clicking add media and there's a pull down for four different options first one is upload photos when you click on that it invites you to choose a file from your hard drive or uh, if you've got a flash drive plugged in, you can choose your files to upload them or you can also drag and drop. It, I see that it does have a max file size of 15 megabytes. I recall that was a question somebody asked and I didn't know off the top of my head. So today's presentation even reminded me and taught me something. So it's hard to remember everything that's in this program, I have to admit. So don't feel bad if you if you feel are feeling a little lost from time to time and don't remember all the things that you're learning. Um, we we all go through that. But anyway, you can upload your your photos from here. And when you upload an image, it's going to allow you to give it a title, what kind of media it is, a year, place, any description, 
and who it's linked to. So if you want to link a particular document or image to more than one person, you can add people from here when you upload the media and click done when you're finished with that. You can upload stories. Um, these are going to be like a, a text file or a document file or a PDF. So maybe you have a life story that's written up about a person, you wanna upload that as a story, you can do that from here. Also, you can upload audio, drag and drop or choose the files. Same kind of, kind of concept there. And create a story will allow you to write a story or upload a story from your computer. If you want to write a story, it's going to open up this window where you can type a title and just type, doo -doo -doo, or you can copy paste from another, like a Word document or something, and copy and paste it into here. You scroll down, it lets you fill in about a description, location, dates, any other inf incidental information about the story that you might want to add. I have to admit that I prefer typing in like a Word document. If it was me personally, I would copy and paste, but I'd already typed into this to enter it into, uh, into Ancestry, but you can certainly just type away in here as well. When you're done filling out all the information, you can add additional people. You can remove people. So if you've got it attached to the wrong person, just click the remove button or add another person. If you want to have multiple people attached to this story that you're putting in. And remember to click save story when you're done. And then to upload a story from your computer, that's going to allow you to just upload directly a document file or a text file has several different um, PDFs also would go here. You can also drag and drop from here as well. Really the only difference between that and like the images is it categorizes it under um, story opposed to photos. They also have a, a button that you can click. So right now we're looking at content. So if I click on sources, it is going to show you all of the images that are related to sources that you've attached through Ancestry or through any of the sources that you have a, um, an image associated with that source. So if you want to see any images associated with the person that are connected to specific sources, they have that option here under the gallery as well. Underneath each, each little image thumbnail, there are three dots. I think those have an official name. I call them three dots. <laughs> um, anyway, that, that's going to pull up a little, a little menu for you to do some editing. You can rename, add tags to the person. You can edit the image. You can remove it from the gallery. You can delete it from the tree. So there's a few options there that you can do with images associated with sources. Now we're going to look at hints. So. Ancestry infamously has a little shaky leaf. It's a little green leaf. It doesn't, it doesn't shake anymore, I don't think. When they first came up with it, it, it just sat there kind of fluttering the whole time. I guess people didn't like that, having all these little leaves just kind of moving on their screen. So then they made it where it just kind of goes, just like, hello, I'm here. I'm a little leaf. Click on me. I have a hint. And now it's just a leaf. I think uh, people kind of generically called it the shaky leaf. So if you hear that, that's talking about, about hints. But besides the little leaf that you see up there on the very top right of, across the, the top menu of the menu, on a person's profile page, it is going to show you the hints that are associated with just that person. So on this example, I've got three hints that I can look at. So when I Click on that, I can see that there are three new hints that I can take a look at and determine if they go along with my person or not. The first one on this example is saying that I have some hints that are ancestry member trees. So I'm just going to kind of talk to you a little bit about using other people's trees as, as, as hint information for you. That you can connect other people's trees basically to your tree so you can click on it and get to another person's tree quickly. And 
I have my personal opinions about this, but I, I'm going to give you just kind of some pros and cons of using that. So we'll, we'll go over a couple of those things. So if you want to take a look at any of these, of the, of these ancestry member tree hints, click on review, because there are pros and cons for, for doing this. And you have to, and really, for me, it varies per tree that I'm looking at. It's never an all or nothing kind of a decision when I'm looking at those um, in, in, in regard to any one individual on my tree. So how do you deal with the information you find on other people's trees? Here's a few suggestions. One, I do not add information, just carte blanche from another person's tree and go, wow, look at everything they have about this, this guy. I, I didn't know all that. And I just load it all into my tree. I use um, that there, there are some exceptions to that rule if you know and trust the person, but I, I tend to use these more as, as, as hints. I do use member trees as a resource to broaden my research for my tree. There have been multiple times where I take a look at another member's tree and they'll have um, a marriage or a marriage date in place or children or a spouse that I didn't know of or a spouse's certain, you know, like a, a, a spouse's surname, maiden name for a wife that I didn't know about. And I'll look at their tree and sometimes I'll discover that they have sources that are really good and solid. And I'm like, wow, that, that's good solid information I can add to my tree. Other times I will look and they have all this information entered on their tree, but no sources associated with it. But I can take that as a clue for me to do research. I can be like, well, man, I never knew that that wife had a what her surname was they've got a surname of jones now i can start doing some research and see if i can find any information about a jones that will give me some valid sources and resources so i will i will use that as clues i also take a look at name and date variation between the trees because there often are even if they don't have sources that verify the information it gives me the opportunity to do research in that direction and see if I can find sources that back that up or not. I will add information to my tree when I find reliable sources on other people's trees and add that to my body of knowledge. And there are times when I will email the owner of another member tree and ask them about their tree information some examples is helpful sometimes to get context of why they entered certain dates, places, or names if they don't have any good source information to look at. Sometimes they had a fa family Bible, but they just didn't bother to type that in to their ancestry tree. Might be a family legend that's been passed down. They might have a source associated with someone that you don't necessarily agree with, but you want to have a conversation about where they got that from and See if you can dig a little deeper into it. There, there could be a myriad of reasons why you want to reach out to somebody else and ask them questions, but it, it definitely opens the door for that collaboration and learning more information and sharing information that you have too. So when you are reviewing, um, so to kind of go back, to what we just, I clicked on that review button, right? It's going to open up a page like this. And it's going to show my tree on the right. So I can see my tree is the Busby Tally family tree there on the right. And on the left is the Mir Lucas family tree. And I can compare, I can scroll up and down and compare the information on the left with the information on the right. I can check that box if I like what I'm seeing and I want to add this member's ancestry tree to my body of knowledge. And once I've checked the box, then I can say review selected tree hints. Now it's going to bring up even more detail about that person on their tree compared to mine. And this is where you're able to glean information. So I could click on the tree and go physically look at the tree, vet through all the sources they have. And then if I'm liking information that I'm seeing there, I don't have to type it into my tree. I can compare now. If I put a check mark on the left, like down here by the marriage, they had a marriage date in a place that I didn't have. And it, and it tells me it's new information. There's a little green new 
So if I check the box on the left from their tree, it's going to automatically add that to the information on my tree. So this is how you would glean information that you feel like is valid and helpful to your tree. There's a question every once in a while. I do glance down at the chat. Somebody's got a question about instructions for finding the research tools. Can I show that again? I will go back to that. So you've selected the boxes that you've, you check the boxes that you want to share information and you want to, it moves it over to your tree on the right, click on save to your tree. And now that information shows up on your tree as well. If I click on the name of the tree that's in blue there, it's going to open up their tree. Always remember to glance up at the top left so you can see which tree you're viewing. Now I am looking at the information they have about Jesse and all the sources they have, all the facts, all the family on their tree. And if I want to go back to my tree, I just click on, on the trees and I can back up out of their tree and go back to mine. Okay, I'm going to pause here real quick and pull my Ancestry account over. I'm going to go to this person's profile image because it's the one that's open. Okay, so I believe the question was how to get these tools up here. Um, over on the top right, there is a pull down menu called tools. And if you want that to show up on your, on your uh, person's profile page, you just select or unselect research tools. So you can see when I toggle that on and off, it will bring them up. The same options that are here are all listed in this pull down as well though. I hope that answered the question. Okay, let's go over how to ignore a hint. What if you get a bad hint that you just don't like and you don't wanna see it again? Okay, so perhaps I've taken a look at these member trees and I've Looked, I've scrolled up and down on my, I've, I've looked at them, I've compared, I've done what I want to do with them. I can now select ignore. And it's going to say that you've ignored that hint. And it pops up here under this tab called ignored. And you can always go back to anything, any hints that you've ignored, you can always get back to. There's three options to the right of the new hints, undecided, ignored, and accepted. Those are kind of your options when you're reviewing hints. So you can always get back to hints you ignored. So they're not gone forever. They just aren't on, the, on that immediate pull-up view when you go to hints. And you can close this box by just clicking the X so you don't have to see the little message that says you ignored a hint. And now we'll go over quick compare. So this is, example shows an 1820 census, and there is a button on the right called Quick Compare. If you click on that and toggle it on, it is going to show you on the left just a really brief description of what's in the record and compare it to information that you have on, in your tree about this particular hint information. In this case, because it's a census, it has his residence information. So. I can see, oh, I don't have that information loaded underneath my facts under this person on my tree. So I decide that I want to review this hint. So I click on review. And when I click on review, it's going to open up this panel on the right hand side, this handy little panel that shows me all the information that is there about this, that is in this census or this record. It could be any kind of record. If I click on compare details and toggle that on, that button on, it's going to give me another side-by-side -side comparison with a little more information about what's on the left that's new and what's on the right that I already have in my tree. And you can scroll up and down to compare all that information and decide if you feel like it's a good match or not. And you can see down here at the bottom, it says, does this record match Jesse Dempsey in your tree? And underneath that is a yes or no, or maybe button. So you make your decision, and if it does, you say yes, it matches, and it will show up on your tree then. Now we'll go over the undecided hints. So this image, this view, kind of shows those buttons a little better than my last view. So click review, shows up on the right. 
Does this record match Jesse Dempsey in your tree? Yes, no, or maybe. If I'm not sure as I look at it, I'm like, hmm, that might be his family. But I know that there was another Jesse Dempsey family that lived in that town. And I'm not sure if this is my Jesse Dempsey or the other guy. So I want to go back and look at it when I have time later. So I'm going to click on maybe. Just not quite sure yet. And I don't have time to really vet it out. And click on maybe. Now it is an undecided hint. It gives you the option to say why you were undecided about this hint, or you can just say, yep, it's undecided. And it's going to show up underneath this option here, undecided hints. So I can always go back to anything I wasn't sure about and do a little more research on undecided hints later. If you do want to select the option to um, put why you were undecided so that you remember why you pushed it into that category, you, if it's got a few uh, predetermined options, you can select or you can type your own reason why you're not sure and you think it might be. Adding a record to your tree from hints. All right, adding a hint to your tree. So if I want to, if I am looking at my hints and I'm in this example, I've got the 1830 census, I click review, it opens up this panel. I can click on the image and take a look at it. I can toggle on the compare details. You know, so you can actually click on the image and get an, an enlarged view of that image. Um, and I've decided, yes, this matches him, even though the record was transcribed as Jesser Dempsey. I know this is my family. So I click yes. And it's going to give me that side by side. So I have the option of checking boxes to update the information in my tree from the record. So if it has information that is new, that you want to add to your tree, you have that option now, and then you just click on save to tree after you've compared those different options. And then it shows up under accepted hints. So it will always be under category accepted hints for this person. And when you've reviewed all the hints with the person, it's going to say there are no new hints available. So it's got zero under new, but I've got my three undecided ones that I can go back to. I can go back and look at ignored hints and review those again if I you know, maybe I am thinking about that one hint I ignored and I'm like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have ignored that. I better go back and look at it again. You can get to it right here. And the hint I just accepted just shows up underneath that category. All right, searching categories. From an individual's page, you can do a search that is specific to them. When you click on search from a person's profile page, it's going to open up the search window where all of the search criteria is automatically filled in over here on the left. At the top, you can see a brief summary of the individual. It shows you how many hints are available for that person. You can toggle on or off to browse by category. It's going to pop to the very top of, of the search criteria, any hints that I've already, yeah, any sources that I've already attached to my person from Ancestry. And when you toggle on Browse by Category, it just opens up this, um, this option that basically breaks down the types of records there are and how many records there are to view within each category. So here we've got Census and Voter Lists. You can scroll up and down, or you can click on See All 64 Results. Under Birth, Marriage, and Death, there are See, oh yeah, so under the census and voter list, we've got a total of 64 results. And then that 64 number is coming from the individual results within each category on that type, the census and voter lists. You can also get to all collections by coming way over here to the left underneath the search criteria and just click on all collections. So searching a by record filters, when you click on all collections, Maybe you only want to look for death records, or maybe you only want to look for census and voter lists. You can open up these little arrows for each individual type of category and collection and just do a search that hones in on just a specific type of collection to search. In this case, I've turned on for my filters, Portland, Wills, and Financial, and I want to look specifically at tax lists. And 
it's bringing up very helpful tax lists in Georgia, since I've already autofilled this person lived in Georgia. So I can take a look at any of those, those items. Viewing and navigating images. Um, when you are taking a look at all, all of the possible sources that come up when you do a search, if you hover your mouse over, over the name of the source, it's going to bring up a little preview image and you can click on view image or view record right from there. It's pretty, it's pretty handy um, if you want to just immediately go to the image itself versus looking at the transcribed information. If you click on the, um, to, to look at the, to the view record, it's going to bring up the transcribed information. It still has that little thumbnail off to the right. Over on the top right, there's some, some options, save, print, and share. So just know that you have some options of what to do with that record once you're sitting on it. And if you want to view the image from here, you just click on the image and it's going to open up that image. So when you open the image, you've got, you can zoom in on it. You can go to full screen, which is going to get rid of all the search bars on the top of your browser. Click here to save the image to someone, a person in your tree, or to save it on your computer and just click on the X to close that view. Um, if you are in full, full view and you don't see the X at the, at the left, kind of hover your mouse, mouse in this top middle area and this other X will appear that will exit you, or, or you can hit the escape key. Any of those things will exit you out of the full screen view. To collapse the record info on the, the, that, that panel that opens on the right, you can toggle that on and off with this arrow that points to the right. So just toggle that on and off, and it opens and shuts that information. The tools menu is going to let you print, download, rotate left, rotate right. Sometimes an image comes in and it's sideways, and you can you have the option to rotate it. You can flip it horizontally, vertically. You can invert colors. Sometimes changing things to where, like in this in this image, maybe I want the the writing that's black to Pop, up, pop out as, as white. So inverting the image is going to just change the way you see the colors. There are a few settings items um, to zoom in and out with your mouse wheel or not. To enhance the image, I usually have that on because why not? <laughs> and um, the basic viewer, I don't know what that does. I'll just be honest. I just have it off because I don't want the basic viewer. I want the best viewer. If I ever find out or one of you guys knows, put it in the chat. I'll let you know if I figure it out, but anyway, I always just have that off. Okay, and then um, helps and tips and feedback, and you can also report problems with the image that you might see. It, it, maybe something's transcribed wrong. Maybe the image isn't showing what the description, matching what the description is. There could be lots of things. But if you click on the help, help and tips and feedback, it's going to bring you to a frequently asked question so you can get some help with those kinds of things any of those kinds of categories. All right, so navigating the image tools, navigation of an image, printing, saving, name lab label overviews, any questions that you could possibly have about viewing images is gonna be under, under the, the help. And then you can also share the image. When you click on share, it's going to open up this little preview where you can copy a link. So you can copy the link and email it to yourself or someone else or put it in a document so you can get back to the image easily. You can email it to someone. You can post it on Facebook. I've never done that before. I haven't had a reason to, but if you had a Facebook that was dedicated to the researcher doing that would be nice. You can zoom in and out on the image. If you're not using your, your mouse wheel to roll up and down, you can zoom in and out here. And and click on the X to return to the source page for the image. Or you can use your browser back button to take you back to the search window. Saving an image, you have some options here to save the record to Jesse, the person who you came from the search for. You can save to someone it to someone else in the tree, or you can save it to your shoebox. Your shoebox is just a repository that 
you can go back and look at any images you've viewed if you save them to your shoe box. I will tell you, if you're looking at an image or a, a source from within Ancestry, and you even remotely think you might want to go back to it again, save it to your shoebox. I've learned the hard way, like, oh, I'll be able to get back to this again. That, that was easy. I just click search and boom, it came up. And then the next time I do it, I'm like, I cannot find that record now. So your shoebox is very helpful. So click on save to save to a person. The shoebox is found on your home page, your home tab page. It's over on the, the scroll up, scroll down on the right hand side, you'll find your shoebox there. And if you want to save it to somebody different than the person whose page you came from, maybe you find a record that gave you a hint for someone else in the family, you can navigate to that other person here too. And when you want to save to a tree, it's going to give you this side by side. Click on save to your tree when you're satisfied with what, you've, what you're seeing. And then it's going to show up underneath your ancestry sources here on this list in the middle at the top of your, of your middle sources. Adding sources from outside Ancestry. Um, under sources, you just click on the add and it will give you the option to add a source. You can hand type in any custom source that you want from here. Scroll up and down, fill in the boxes, everything you know about it, create a new source and submit. You can also add a web link. Click on that and it's going to ask you to input a web address for that source. And it will show up under your sources. Source, search filters. Okay, search filters are very helpful. Um, you can edit your search by clicking on the little pencil or begin a new or a blank search that is not filled in by clicking on the three dots. And if you want to edit anything, in the search criteria, it will open up this window so you can um, delete specific information so you can change how it's doing the search by adding or deleting information that you that you that it auto-filled from your tree. Sometimes I'll get rid of all the kids. I'm like, I don't want to search for all the kids. I just XXXX, all the children. I only want to look for the person and a spouse. So you've got different events that you can add if you don't already have them filled in. You can add family members also. And when you are done making any changes there, just make sure filling in any changes you wanna make or add to the person you can change what kind of collection you're looking for by toggling these check boxes on and off and click search to do to create a new search. Um, selecting collections, you can hone in on a specific country or area of the world. That can also be helpful if it's pulling up searches from a country that you don't wanna see. And if you want to clear the search completely, you can clear it from here as well by clicking on clear search. And then you get a completely empty search window that you can type in all your own information into. If you want to search all collections, um, that's on your search tab pull down. These are all shortcuts um, to specific filters, but just remember that search pull down is in all of the collection criteria you've got all of your collection criteria when you go to the actual search button. And you can fill into your heart's content when you get to that search window. This is searching by locality. You can click on a specific place to click on, or hover your mouse over it. It tells you what kind of collections are in that location. You can click on it if you want to see them. You can go to a different specific area of the world and see what kinds of collections they have uh, by, by clicking on the location you want to go to and honing in on the specific country, area of the world, zoom in and out. And on the bottom right is view all, all of the card catalog. Card catalog has every collection that Ancestry has, and they're constantly updating. This is something you want to explore. If you've been in Ancestry before, you want to see if they have new collections for a specific part of the world, make sure you go here. You can type in titles or keywords. You can use the filters to navigate around. They're listed by title, and then by category, and then the number of records. And you can sort by the date added, date updated, the collection title, 
You can also filter by date. That brought us to the end. So thanks for hanging out with me. Next time I teach, I'll be going over using your ancestry DNA test. And you're welcome to email me if you have questions.